Welcome to this session about sophisticated technology at sea. This may quite possibly be the most perfect ocean related conversation to have at this moment in time, because just before this session ends, NASA's Perseverance would have landed on the red planet. But for our blue planet, the future is here. So I'm very pleased to introduce the moderator of this session, our advisory board member, Professor Ralph Rayner. Ralph is a professor, professorial research fellow at the London School of Economics. Uh, he's chairman of Sonodyne International. He's chair of Oceanology International and immediate past president of the Society of Underwater Technology. He also has responsibility for industry advocacy and outreach for the US Integrated Ocean Observing System at NOAA and is a trustee of the Plymouth Marine Laboratory in the UK. And on top of all of that, he's also a fellow of the Explorers Club. So Ralph, I'd like to hand this over to you. Thank you very much, Jotika. We live in a time of profound change in the way we work at sea. Robotics, autonomous systems, new communications technology, new sensors, the application of artificial intelligence and machine learning are all creating new possibilities for the exploration of our ocean planet. Here to tell us about how all these technologies come together in a celebration of a voyage that took place 400 years ago, I'm delighted to introduce our keynote speaker, Brett Fenoff. Brett is Managing Director of the Mayflower Autonomous Ship, and a founding board member of Primari. Designed in honor of the 400th anniversary of the original Mayflower, this new Mayflower is an advanced, fully autonomous prototype marine research vessel with AI as its captain. It's scheduled to make its maiden transatlantic crossing from Plymouth, UK to Plymouth, USA in April 2021, so April of this year. Over to you, Brett. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. And I guess I can't see my slides, but they'll come up, I guess. Um, I appreciate your having me. It's austere company to say the least. And as uh, Ralph alluded to, I am the director of a research program building the Mayflower Autonomous Ship, which is an AI vessel that's designed to do ocean and climate research for long periods at sea, uh, and then broadcast that data free to a web portal and through NOAA to anybody that might want it uh, for their scientific research. It's been funded by a nonprofit company in Connecticut, and we're building it here in the UK to make the Plymouth to Plymouth voyage in the right direction. You can go to the next slide, please. So the Mayflower, as everybody knows, sailed in 1620 from Plymouth, and uh, we were sitting around one day at the city trying to decide what we were going to do to commemorate that voyage. And there was talk about building a replica ship and I thought, well, nobody came here today on a horse, so there's no need to build a replica of a 17th century ship because at the end of the day, that's all we're going to have. And what we should do is seek inspiration instead from sort of what I think is the most important part of the original voyage, which is this jumping off into the unknown, right? There was no guarantee that it would be successful. It was fraught with risk, but it seemed worth it. And so I feel the same way about this ship, although our risks are infinitesimal by comparison to the people that embarked across the ocean 400 years ago. So we've built this sort of 15 meter long unmanned aluminum and composite vessel that's powered by solar, by wind, by diesel electric hybrid drive uh, to try and make this crossing again and then spend longer and longer periods of time at sea collecting data with a vast array of instruments on it. Uh, and then sending that back, as I said, distributed for everybody to use. But this ship's a little bit different than some of the robotic systems that are out there in that it was designed from inception, not only not to have people on it, but to not have to have people control it at all. So we decided we'd build an AI captain. And that seemed like a great idea five years ago, but technologically, we weren't sure we'd be able to do it. In fact, we couldn't figure out how to get the power literally and then the compute power out to the edge so that we could make it make all these decisions that it had to make it see. And the pace of the technological evolution that's allowed us to squeeze it all into what's relatively a small vessel is probably the most fascinating thing and speaks to the future more than anything else on even this particular voyage. Next slide, please. And as you can see, we actually went ahead and built it. It's launched. It comes apart in three sections if you need to truck it somewhere. Uh, the hull was made in Poland and then the rest of it was built here in Plymouth, UK. But we had the help of uh, lots of technical giants, NVIDIA, 
IBM is its chief sponsor and provided us all the foundational technology to build the software on board that would allow it to navigate safely. And then many, many other companies from AIS providers, satellite providers, people who do underwater hydrophone arrays, every instrument you can imagine you might want on the ship we tried to put on, and I'll show you a list later. But for me, what was most interesting about it was whether or not we could build something that would get to the point where we could just tell it go to Plymouth, Massachusetts, and it would think about, well, thinks the wrong word, it doesn't really think, it would make a series of decisions by looking at weather and current and its current condition and the instrument load that it had in it and be able to chart its own course, leave and not have a collision, be able to identify all the obstacles at sea and also scientific input at sea. So listening for cetaceans and marine mammals, watching its instrument cluster and determining if there's something interesting or novel that it had to slow down and take a closer look at, all without talking to us. So it was designed from that point back uh, and it's been challenging. And I was just speaking to the group earlier today about the challenge of just before this started about the challenges of robotics. Today, it decided to go in a circle for an hour. Um, we still haven't figured out why, but it's not going in a circle now, it's back at shore. And we're gonna solve that problem tomorrow. But um, those are the challenges with these very complex integrated devices. Uh, we still don't know why it didn't do what it should have done. But that's sea trials, and so hopefully it won't do that in the Atlantic. We can go to the next one, please. But in order to sort of underpin what we had to achieve with this, we had to take things a little bit further forward than just building a ship. We didn't have any of the data that we needed about how a ship is supposed to identify obstacles and fuse all the data from its sensors and then build sort of this AI captain. So we actually built infrastructure in Plymouth, which has now sort of been rebranded as a Plymouth Smart Sound. But we built all the physical infrastructure offshore around Plymouth Sound. You can see a chart there. We put up installations to gather data, optical data, infrared data, radar, LIDAR, subsea data, current data. We integrated information from the hydrographic office. And this went on for four or five years while we made models and ultimately produced a digital twin of the whole smart sound and integrated with the offshore buoy network that's been run by PML for many, many years. Now we've got sort of installations built up that are 5G enabled from a grant from the government and has become sort of an autonomous vehicle test bed. And those little red dots you see are actually sort of where the AI captain lives. It lives offshore on an old Victorian fort and it lives on the end of a pier and it's constantly trying to move the pier and the fort around to avoid collisions, which it can't do very easily. Uh, but we've been stressing it for years and years and years. And as the size of the instruments and the size of the compute power on the edge came down, we were able to figure out how to squeeze it into the ship. And uh, that has been an interesting undertaking. But now we've got this infrastructure and that's also being cloned for Plymouth, Massachusetts. We're connected with other ports around the world, around Europe. We're sharing data in a, in a format that lets our ships kind of work together, whether they're manned or unmanned. And we're hoping that that'll proliferate. And uh, one of the bigger issues we have to solve is the regulatory framework for unmanned vehicle systems. Right now, there aren't any real rules that govern how we deploy this. So we're working through coal regs. We're working through uh, issues with various coast guards and all the nations will stop in uh, and hopefully help resolve some of those issues on the deployment of these robotic systems at sea in the near future. Can you go to the next one, please? And there she is at sea in conducting her, her initial set of sea trials before it decided to drive in a circle. And it integrates quite a few instruments, more than these. We have constantly been updating it, but from various types of radar that you'd normally see to prototype systems, optical and infrared camera systems, multiple satellite systems, AIS systems, uh, precision positioning systems. We know where it is to within a few centimeters real time. Uh, we can run CTDs and partial CO2, O2, pH fluorometry, tow a hydrophone array to listen to marine mammals. We even take physical samples of water at sea and we still have some payload bays left open and we're hoping to make those available uh, in the very near future for people to propose experiments and then we can put them on sort of like the old space shuttle did before. Well, back when I was watching the space program and we get to, to be entertained by a landing on Mars tonight, which is magnificent. Um, but as I said, these things couldn't happen four or five years ago, but now we feel like we can do this safely. And all the people on the panel tonight um, 
are working with very similar technologies from space to the surface of the ocean to the deepest parts of the sea. And they're in a unique position to talk about the future of technology. This Mayflower ship is just a corollary for it. There are so many robotic, automated, and autonomous and AI-enabled system, uh, systems emerging now. But these people that will speak about it tonight actually build, they, they create the questions that have to be asked because they have a profound understanding of the processes of the ocean. They help build the instruments and then they get to interpret that data to the scientific community and the public. And this ship is one tool that can help add to the corpus of data and ultimately information being processed on the edge. But I worry about a glut of information that's going to require ever more complex algorithms to manage and interpret and to disseminate. And so the most important thing at the end of the day, even though this is about autonomy, is the people. It's that creative and intuitive part of research that can't be replicated by a machine. So we always like to tell people what we pursue is augmented intelligence to help us be better people, not artificial intelligence. These things should help us understand the planet better and help bring us together in a way that we can take action to solve some of the biggest problems that face us in the future. And then I think that's my last slide. Thank you, Brett, for a fascinating and thought provoking talk. We've got time for a few questions from the audience, and I have one uh, here. What role do you see man ships such as Falcor playing supporting the work of Mayflower like systems? Oh, I, well, that's an interesting question. I think Mayflower like systems will support vessels like Falcor, actually. Um, what we can do is drive the cost down to being at sea for very long periods of time and collecting more data. And you know, with the confluence of sort of the internet of space sort of things that IBM's working on with others, being able to push all that processing to the edge and then up into space, even process it there and then have it almost real time available as actionable data or actionable information by manned vessels, uh, or even back in the lab, we can better plan where we're gonna put our manned assets, which are very expensive. Uh, to field. And, you know, in the UK, we've got three excellent assets. One's going to retire in the, in the near future, or not quite 10 years or so, but that's near in technological terms, I guess. But, um, and the question is, do we replace it with another manned vessel? I actually don't think you can do good research if you don't go to sea. You have to go to sea. You have to be connected to it. Um, when I was a grad student, I remember one person finishing up their dissertation being invested, sort of being questioned by their uh, committee. And they were a mathematical modeler looking at fluid dynamic processes, but they actually had lived in the middle of the United States their whole life and had never been to sea and just worked in a flume. And, I, and, and they just could not rectify this. And they made him go back and take some very basic courses and they made him go to sea before they'd give him his PhD. I actually think it was the right choice. So these things have to help but they can't replace people. The most important part of this is people. So it's about bringing price down or cost down so we can get more data, create better, more resolute, more precise information and better target where we put our human assets. Sorry, I didn't mean to run on and on. But. That's fine. No, thanks for that. And um, now a further question, and that's around the data that, um, that you're, um, pick, you're collecting. Are you um, collecting any bathymetric data? Uh, we're not doing any deep water bathymetric data. We've got some precision echo sounders on board. So when we're on the continental shelves, we can do that. Um, we will install at some point a multi-beam echo sounder. We haven't decided which one we're looking at, uh, which we want to deploy. We're also going to install at a later date a towed asset with an interferometric side scan so we can cover a larger area of the seafloor, particularly in shallow water. Okay, and a question about the uh, the vessel after the voyage. So successful crossing, hopefully, is the Atlantic. What are the plans after that successful crossing? Well, we, we, we've got a pretty full plate, actually. We, we've been coordinating very closely with NOAA and with US Coast Guard and Canadian Hydrographic Service and Transport Canada. And they've asked us if we'd stick around for the remainder of the summer and the entire fall and run a research program between Cape Cod and Halifax and doing some cetacean marine mammal studies uh, and a few other things, a few instruments that they've yet to determine that they want to put on board. They want to integrate the ship systems with uh, data they're getting from buoys, from gliders and from uh, airborne assets and also some space-based assets uh, and see if we can get a sort of multi-domain 
uh, mesh network working uh, uh, in a very complex uh, <laughs> machine learning arrangement to retask the ship without a person having to decide what's interesting. So uh, it's way beyond my capability, but it, it'll be spending the fall and then overwintering in Massachusetts. And then uh, if it gets too snowy, maybe we'll go to the Gulf of Mexico. I think it's probably snowing there, isn't it, at the moment? <laughs> yeah, well, that's, well, maybe the Bahamas then. There's always yeah. good reason to the Bahamas. So, well, thanks again, Brett, for an excellent um, start and lead in to, uh, to our panel discussion. Before starting our panel discussion, we'd like to share a short video that illustrates some of the technology that SOI has supported and tested over the last few years. So the ocean is changing on, over multiple scales. It's changing over multiple spatial scales, mo multiple temporal scales as well. And oceanographers have a variety of tools at their disposal to study things that happen over long time scales or events that take place in a single location. But where we're a lot more limited is when we try to understand events that are taking place over large areas and at fast uh, temporal resolutions as well. So hopefully we are contributing to the tool set of um, of techniques available to oceanographers to study a kind of phenomenon that they've really had trouble addressing in the past. The midwater region of the ocean is one of the least explored places, some would argue, on our planet. And so our goal here is to really develop new tools and techniques for observation of that uh, life so that one day we could perhaps reverse engineer what they're doing and apply it to other technologies. Our new understanding of these mechanisms will help us improve atmosphere-ocean interaction models and allow us to predict um, more robustly weather patterns in the future. When you develop a new technology, there's always risks. And, and what we're doing here, we, although we are developing new technology, we're doing the same measurements in traditional methods. So even if the new technology fails, we're also always going to be able to rely on the traditional methods. And we can use these traditional methods to kind of like calibrate, see if these are new technologies are actually performing well. brought on board the deep PIV instrument, which allows us to essentially see things in completely different ways um, in the deep sea. And um, it's the first time we'll be deploying it off of ROV Sebastian. Most of the science that we were doing here, it's kind of pushing the boundaries of the comfortable science. We're testing many new technologies. We have, you know, tested two or three new instruments, two or three new approaches, and all of them actually gave us information. So I think since we don't analyze things so much here, but we take it home, I think the surprise is just yet to come. All in all, this cruise has been a huge success for everyone involved. The complex and wide-ranging data set collected during this cruise will allow us to better understand how our ocean will react to a changing climate and ultimately how humankind can better prepare for its future on this planet. So having set the scene, I'd like to introduce you to our four panelists, Dr. Chris Zappa, Dr. Ivona Setenik, Dr. Kakani Kajita Katija and Dr. Blair Thornton. Christopher Zappa is the Lamont Research Professor at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, Columbia University. His research interests include air sea interaction, wave dynamics, wave breaking, near surface turbulence, heat, gas, and momentum transport, infrared remote sensing, upper ocean, coastal, and estuarine processes. Ivona is a plankton ecologist at NASA and uses optical tools to shed light on the role that phytoplankton play in oceanic biogeochemical cycles. Her research interests focus on sub scale processes, ocean observing technology, and silicoflagellates. 
Kikani is a princ pr principal engineer at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute and leads the Bioinspiration Lab. Her research interests include bio-inspired engineering design, underwater imaging, and the use of AI for persistent and targeted observation in the ocean. Blair Thornton is a professor of marine autonomy at the University of Southampton and holds an adjunct position at the University of Tokyo. His research interests are in sensing and autonomy in marine science, and he has an innovation fellowship to develop passive underwater robotic systems for scalable seabed mapping. I'd now like to invite each of our panelists to say a few words of introduction. So let's start with Chris. Thanks, Ralph. Um, as, as you can imagine, studying atmosphere ocean interaction is a very dynamic environment, and I'm constantly working to develop new sensing systems and platform capabilities to make observations in this kind of in this environment. And one of the most re more recent or I've been working for the past decade on uh, platforms that include high endurance UAVs um, <clears throat> and using them from ships. So you may see small drones over land often, but really doing work at sea, you need high endurance. So when I say high endurance, we're talking eight to 10 hours flying them out over the ocean and, and telemetering that data back real time so that we can use this platform as a, almost a, an exploration device where you send it out over the horizon and you telemeter the data back in real time and you're looking for certain specific processes. For instance, on the recent cruise on the Falco, we were looking for algal blooms. <clears throat> so when we get that data back, we can um, reallocate all of the, the ship itself, the all the instruments in the water, take them out, put it back in the water over by where the bloom is, maybe 10, 20 nautical miles away and really focus on the process that we wanna study. So it's a really UA, UAVs or un, uncrewed or unoccupied aerial vehicles allow us this capability. And I think I do, yeah, there it is. There's a picture of one right above my head that we used from the Falcor. So I'll, I'll keep it simple and let the next person go. And um, if I could ask Ivona to uh, just say a few words of introduction. Yeah, sure. Um, I had some slides, but we, oh, there's slides. But um, I just wanted to say that like, what brought me to work with the technology or the limitations of the methods that I was kind of familiar with when I started, you know, looking at the phytoplankton. As I said, I'm, I'm a phytoplankton ecologist. I'm really interested in their diversity, but limitations are overconnected with this, these discrete methods where we have to sample the water and kind of look at it under a microscope or do DNA, whatever. We're limited by that stuff because if we want to really understand the role that these little guys are playing in, in the whole ocean, their global cycle and ecosystem, we really have to know a lot about their continuous distribution. And that's where the technology started now. That's where I figure out that I have to use different techniques and I switch to physical methods of measuring biology in a sense. I start looking at light, um, different aspects of the light, color, intensity, and polarization to kind of try to get a better grasp of the other things. And uh, if you go to the next slide, um, that's kind of how I ended up with PACE in NASA. Uh, PACE is NASA's new mission called Plankton Aerosol Cloud Ocean Ecosystem that is going to be looking at the phytoplankton diversity from, from space. But in order to understand what we're seeing from space, we have to go back to the field um, and collaborate with amazing scientists such as these ones here and many others that I work with to um, develop better methods of continuously measuring not only the phytoplankton diversity, but also different aspects and different roles that they play in this oceanic carbon cycle. So then ultimately, um, you know, you can bring that back and, and correlate um, with the measurements that you're doing from like way above there in the atmosphere, either from the hyperspectral aspect, which is um, one of the ways that we're going to measure with pace or polarization. So um, I'll stop there. So I'll keep it short, but thank you. I'm happy to be here today. And uh, over to Kakani. Um, right. Thank you. Um, well, thank you first for inviting me and um, hosting this. Um, and, you know, I've been really fortunate to be involved in a number of different projects. Um, we really been working on primarily a number of imaging systems, uh, both laser-based illumination and stereo or volumetric imaging systems. But first starting with remotely operated vehicles. And so we've been fortunate to go to sea on the Falcor uh, in late 2019 and we'll again deploy our laser system, the DPIV instrument that you saw in that vi vid video uh, 
um, to conduct 3D reconstructions of animals in the water column um, this summer. But more recently, we started delving into autonomous systems as well. And this transition from a remote to autonomous vehicles has been catalyzed by our involvement in the development of the Mesobot, which is a vehicle specifically designed for midwater observations led by Dana Yerger at Hui and involving a number of other researchers at Mbari, Stanford, uh, and University of Texas. Um, if we can replay this video, I can explain what this is. Um, but so the Mesobot is a, designed to be a hybrid vehicle that can visually track uh, objects for up to 24 hours. And so we've been developing the tracking and vehicle control algorithms with you know, Steve Rock at Stanford. And through that process, we learned that tracking animals for a long time autonomously is very, very hard. Um, and so what we're starting to do now and what you see in this footage is we're integrating artificial intelligence uh, to distinguish between different objects in video and imagery uh, to provide image-based navigation for missions like these. Um, but then to try and build on this, because this is really just one use case for artificial intelligence in the ocean, we're creating a, a, a database, a large-scale database called FathomNet to provide training data uh, for the entire research community um, and commercial community to use. Um, so anyways, I'm gonna hand it over, but these are just kind of a series of, of problems and um, you know uh, projects we've been working on. And uh, finally, over to Blair. Hi, so my name is Blair Thornton. Thank you very much for inviting me today. Um, I've been working in deep sea robotics, sensing and data interpretation for about 20 years now. And during this time, I've spent 450 days at sea on over 55 expeditions deploying robotic systems and applications ranging from ecological monitoring through to exploration, infrastructure inspection and disaster response after the tsunamis and a nuclear disaster in Japan 2011. And most of the work that I have done to date is related to wide area C4 visual mapping. So underwater, light doesn't travel very far. A robot can see about the size of a table or a desk, but we're interested in understanding vast areas. So we need these robots to move around and map wide areas. And the key thing that I work on is improving the throughput from data. So those are the photos and the observations that a robot makes in the ocean through to generation of human knowledge. Thinking about both the speed at which knowledge gets generated and also the amount of knowledge we can generate. Because gaining knowledge is basically the only reason why we send, in, why we send these things out into the ocean in the first place. And the slide I have here basically illustrates that autonomous systems are getting very good at gathering data and gathering more and more of it every day. But currently, a vast majority of data is processed offline in the comfort of people's homes and offices because the analysis usually takes months or even years to complete. And the consequence of that is that most of the discoveries that we make take place on land months or years after the observations were originally made, at which point our ships, the people, the robots that gather the data are nowhere near the place where something was discovered anymore, and we can't do anything more about it. So because the workflows we use assume this discrete process of going somewhere, gathering a lot of data and coming back to process it before repeating the whole cycle again, we end up in this situation where the more data we gather, the more interesting the discovery, the harder and harder it is for us to keep up with these and make discoveries while they're still relevant and timely. We have this problem of latency of information. If we had 100 many times as many robots, 100 times as, many, as much data, we'd wait 100 times as long for the discovery. So my research really tries to prepare us so that we can move away from this mentality of discrete events and sequences that we've had ever since the first marine expedition. Start thinking about how we can gather, process, and learn from data in a continuous way without a defined and start endpoint to make building insight truly scalable. Thanks for those great introductions, which nicely sets us up for our discussion. While we're having a, an, an initial panel discussion, please post your questions for the panelists because we'll pick those up a, a little later. So I'd like to start with uh, uh, discussing how recent technology changes have influenced the way that you work. And I'd like to ask each of you, which recent technology has had the greatest influence on the way you conduct your research? So let's start with Chris. <clears throat> Thanks, Ralph. The so for me, the doing work at sea is um, 
because I study ocean interaction, you go to a spot and you hope weather comes by, a storm comes by. You to you could be sitting there waiting for you know a full month at sea and may not get what you're looking for. The beauty of these UAVs, while you don't look for go look for weather, you can go look for a process. So, for instance, as I mentioned earlier, on a recent cruise on the Falcor, we were looking for um, cyanobacteria blooms, and while they're very prevalent, they are very patchy. So the UAVs allow us um, the capability to go and search and find these blooms. And then once you find them, you can track them over time. And to do that with real-time data coming back and where you can um, adaptively sample your, your region and, um, <clears throat> is really a powerful tool to make science much more efficient, at least for what I do in their senior action. Okay, and, and Ivona, how, how is, what, what aspect of technology has most influenced the way that you, uh, you conduct your research? Well, uh, I mean, mine is kind of a continuation of Chris's, but it's just kind of a little bit under the surface. I think recent development in underwater technology that allowed for minimization of the instrumentation as well as deployment of those ones autonomous vehicles is something that completely changed my world. As I said, you know, I started by staring under the microscope um, and looking at the fight up and the point that I can, you know, rely on this information coming from autonomous vehicles that in some cases have capabilities continuously monitoring phytoplankton. Um, and that has been a big game changer for me. And, and I found myself from being a classical biologist that, uh, you know, it's just looking at the shapes and, and counting things to somebody who does, you know, data processing, big algorithm making and things like that completely shifted the way I think about gaining my data and processing and looking at my data. So a strong autonomy theme, as you'd expect, perhaps, coming out there. <laughs> um, Kakani, uh, anything that you'd like to add from your perspective? Um, well, a number, a number of things. Um, I think, obviously, the explosion of, of tools that we're seeing um, for machine learning has been really impactful, but also has improved access um, to be able to develop or train some of these novel algorithms. Um, I would say also more recently, um, telepresence has been phenomenal, um, right? We've all been kind of dealing with and struggling with, with COVID and, you know, we've been fortunate to uh, be able to spin up telepresence like at Ambari in a really short period of time. And so being able to have that flexibility, um, you know, to do the work um, anywhere in the world and observe and also contribute to, to, to cruises, I think has is, is just been fantastic on so many levels. And uh, Blair, your, your perspective on that question. Yeah, so I deploy deep sea autonomous robotic systems in some of the most extreme environments we put our autonomous vehicles. And one of the things that's really influenced the way I work, I'm gonna say is satellites. Satellites do lots of things. And one of these is estimating underwater terrains. And the estimates aren't particularly good. They normally have a resolution of a couple of kilometers, which means that if you took a big city like London, it would look like any other city because it only consists of a handful of data points. But the point is that that data exists everywhere. Every marine researcher has used satellite data. And even if no one's ever been to the place you're deploying your robot, you're guaranteed to have this lowest common denominator of data available. So I think it's not only about the kind of state of the art observations that are incredible, but only relevant to a few people interested in a particular spot on the planet, but it's the everywhereness of data or services that you really have a scalable impact. Fascinating. So let's move on to thinking about some of the uh, barriers to new technology coming into use. Um, as everyone said, there's an explosion of tools that you can use, lots of new things coming along all the time. I'd like to ask each of you where you see the main barriers to emerging technologies transitioning into operational use? Because it's one thing coming up with a new technology, it's another thing making it usable and usable in, in the long term. So let's start, start with you again, Blair, pick up from where you left off. Yeah, I think making it relevant to people is, is a big barrier. When you're developing things that are state of the art, it's relatively easy to populate a highlight reel or video, but the initial gut reaction you get from 
a community is that it isn't relevant to them because they can't replicate it with their systems or it just doesn't add value to the things they want to do at the end of the day. So I think research in engineering has really shifted from developing technologies for the highlight reel towards developing technologies that are going to be the, the bread and butter, the basics of how we do things. And compared to 10 years ago, and people are much less interested in how deep the robotic system is going to go or the resolution of the camera. The focus is much more on you know, how robust is your technology and is it still going to add value when the conditions, the visibility is not good or the platform's got some bad control or problems like that. So I think the real challenge is about taking the community with you as opposed to just pushing the boundaries of what we can do. And Kakani, your perspective on barriers to entry for new technologies? Uh, it's very similar to Blair's comment um, because I think a lot of the time it, it kind of goes hand in hand. Um, I think resources, but also people, um, because you know if unless the technology has been you know fully developed right beyond the two year or three year demonstration that we're normally funded to do the work, right? The the next step in terms of trying to make something that's robust during operation requires time. It also requires, you know, effort or willingness to participate in that process. And, you know, frankly, we don't see that a lot, um, which I think has been a challenge, right? The barrier to the adoption and, and use operationally of all these new technologies. So, so very similar uh, response or answer from Blair's. And Ivona? I mean, I can just, you know, connect to them and continue down the path. I mean, if we don't see some kind of technological, I mean, if you don't have like an industry partner or a way to actually make this um, popular, there's really no way that majority of the world can afford it. I mean, like we are here talking from mostly, you know, from US or, or Western based universities and things like that. And I have colleagues in Croatia um, who just have a CTD that goes only to hundred meters. So like, even if we develop this amazing technology and if we don't find a path to make it really more available to the scientists all around the world, um, I mean, we're never gonna get anywhere there. So it's kind of like availability. Um, just like, you know, it's not enough to fund the development of awesome technology, but also you have to fund this, you know, like, I don't know how to call it, the, you know, making it cheaper, making it available for everywhere, because it's so just, it's, it, we're still staying in ivory tower, way, way, way high up there. And, and Chris, your perspective on, on that question. I think I would, I would concur with everyone, what everyone has said, resources and, and how focused we are. One thing I would say is um, that in all these, in, in, in this endeavor, in my endeavor, maybe everyone's the need for getting community um, buy-in is critical. If you get the community is behind what you're doing, it will make it um, easier to make those um, make those next those next steps. For instance, in, in in my case, I would think that maybe having a a facility that the whole community can use, rather than I think a lot of times we we go off in our little corners and we do our own little thing. Um, but I think making those capabilities more broadly used will and think will facilitate that as well. I mean, maybe I'm not expressing it perfectly, but I see exactly where you're, you're where you're coming from. So we've got a few minutes to spare in this part of the session, and I'll ask everyone in the audience to keep sending your questions in. I've only got a couple so far; could do with a few more. Um, but while we're waiting for those questions to come in, I'm going to pose a third question, which we haven't uh, thought through before, um, and that's around the whole innovation process. So innovation is about marrying technology push with application pull, and in this case, science pool how do you most if most effectively create that interface between the scientific need and the technology capability who would like to have a go at that where where do, where do you get that interface to work most effectively Blair people people who can speak both languages I think there's so many barriers from just uh, kind of miscommunication and people unable to understand and respect each other's perspectives. And that's because, you know, I was trained as an engineer and uh, someone else might be uh, trained in deep sea ecology. And that's where opportunities like going out to sea where you're, you're forced to be with these people who've had a completely different background to you and you, you need to understand 
each other because you're on that ship, you're the only people there and you've got to get something useful out of that time, out of that investment. So I think that, that ability to be multilingual um, across sciences, uh, engineering, and I think that's extending out to, to politics and, and, and communication to the public. I think that's the real, real key here. And a ship is the perfect place because you've isolated a group of people and they're, they're forced to spend time talking to each other. Um, so it's a great environment for that. If, no, if for no other reason, taking people to sea just to achieve that would be worthwhile. Um, anyone else like to have a, a, a stab at that question? Kakani, I think I saw you yeah, with your hand up. I have, um, well, partly because I have a, you know, pretty different perspective because I, um, I would say only recently have been more and more involved in ocean technology. Um, and you know, my, my degree is actually in bioengineering. And for fun, I actually attend uh, the Society of Integrative and Comparative Biology meetings every year. Um, partly because I, I, you know, I'm just really fascinated by the approaches that these researchers use to try and understand biology, like how it works. And it's, it's while being immersed in these different communities, you, you learn really quickly what, what, the, what, the, what are the novel science use cases? What are the novel questions? Like if, if people were, had this technology available to them, what could they do? And, and really the only way to get that information is to you know, immerse yourself in that community in some way and have these conversations um, and discussions. So um, it's not easy to do, right? Because you know, we're all trained um, to do things very differently, but um, you know, really reaching out and talking to people is, at least in my my view, the, the best way to to pursue innovation. So encouraging people to deliberately seek out opportunities to to jump across disciplines and across sectors, jump between science and engineering. Yeah, I'm certainly a, a very strong advocate of that. Um, anyone else want to add anything on that question? Um, I mean, I can say a couple of things. If you want, I mean, like. That's something that I've seen the most uh, happening as I've been since started working in NASA. The way that the now the instruments on 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 this mission are built and base are built is pretty much this con continuous communication of of engineers and scientists, where each of us are training something else, but we're kind of pushing ourselves in really uncomfortable situations there. And and like the vocabulary, I mean, like they say charts, we say slides. It starts from there. That's the the way how we talk about PowerPoint and the. You know, the vocabulary is completely different, but you just kind of, as Kakani said, immerse yourself in something that is uncomfortable and you're going to learn the lingo and you're going to learn their needs and you're going to start understanding what is driving them. And then you're just going to start changing your, your communication pattern, your, the way you communicate, the way you talk. I mean, and that's, again, it's a combination of pushing yourself in somewhere where you're not really comfortable, but also like modifying your communication technique to actually transfer the message and uh, to get a work towards something better. <laughs> And, and part and parcel of that is learning to speak the language. And I mean, in the, in the discipline sense of, because when you cross disciplines, you find that there's a, a distinct linguistic challenge. <laughs> Sometimes the same thing is referred to with two different names or, and that, that's a challenging thing. Anything you want to add, Chris, before we move on or shall I? Um, most of my, most of my, um... I mentioned that I develop, uh, I do develop my own sensors. And so most of my development needs are based on, you know, <clears throat> if I need to measure something at the ocean surface that someone is not able to measure right now, I'll figure out a way to do it. Um, whether it's an imaging system or something in situ. Um, and then a few, you know, then teaming up with, with um, partners in, in the commercial aspects that already have the, the, um, Kind of the infrastructure to do which the vision that you may have so teaming up with partners in in um in industry definitely is helpful so I've, i'm hearing a lot of common ground here about instead of narrowing in broadening out um and that's i think where the, the real learning takes place i see we've got a related question from the audience to, on this topic so i'm going to pick that one up now um you've all spoken about using technology to do something you couldn't do before where do you think the next iteration of technology is going to come from um, and what impact do you feel that might have on on your work who would like to uh, have a go at that one the what's next <laughs> i 
I can answer a portion of it. There's so, I mean, there's so many different paths. One really cool path would be allowing that technology to be accessible to everyone. Um, and that's one path. And that, that sets, you know, that's a sh shifting baseline. Now sets the baseline higher up and you allow new generations, diverse generations to be inspired by the same technology that allowed me to shift my science and develop new technologies, so on. It's like a perpetuum mobile, you know? But I'm sure, you know, that's just like one of the ideas, um, regardless of the technology that it is. Anyone else want to, uh, to I, have a, a stab at that? Kakani? Uh, I also, I think a big important part of this too is, is community engagement, right? Because like Ivona said earlier, um, we don't want to, we don't want to limit the ocean and the exploration of the ocean to, or discovery of the ocean to just, you know, those of us in our ivory towers, right? And, and so I think really that that's what's next, right? The fact that there's a, a, a global workforce, a global uh, community out there that could be contributing to these problems or these, you know, questions that we're, we're trying to solve and answer. Um, and so, I mean, me personally, um, I very briefly mentioned FathomNet. You know, the, the goal of FathomNet is to create uh, an ImageNet equivalent for underwater imagery um, so that, you know, anyone can uh, download imagery, train algorithms, use the data and apply it to their, their, their particular science question. Um, and in order for that to be successful, we have to entrain a lot of people, um, not just experts, but, you know, general enthusiasts who, who want to, you know, at least either, either contribute to or augment the, the data. So, um, you know, happy to talk about that further, but you know, that's, I, I, for me, at least personally, that's where I'm seeing a lot of this going is, is enhanced community engagement. Thank you for that. I'm just gonna digress for a second because I've just seen a, a post about the, uh, the time for the uh, Mars landing. Um, are we still okay to proceed with some more questions? Eight minutes to go. Eight minutes, okay. So picking up on some of the other questions then from the audience um, and one about the digital divide. So we're talking about a lot of very sophisticated technology here. How do we overcome the lack of access for some people to, the, to basic technology? And how can we combat technology literacy issues? Any thoughts on that? That's quite a hard question to answer. I feel like you can ask anyone in any government and they wouldn't really be able to provide a, a really good answer for that. I, I wish I I wish I knew. Um, but I but I think that's where we're starting to see, you know, movements in the community towards uh, cheaper uh, technologies, you know, cheaper um, solutions. Um, also, you know, recognizing too that data is is kind of a way to um, be more equitable, right, in, in the, the process of sharing the ocean, at least that's one of the viewpoints I have. Um, and, and so I don't, I don't have a good answer for it, but we're starting to see movement in this area to try and provide similar technologies that, you know, are more, more accessible and more attainable. I mean, that divide, if anything, is getting wider, not narrower. So it's it's going to be a really pressing challenge. Anyone else got any thoughts on that? Or shall I move on to the next question? Okay, this one's really about um, complexity versus simplicity um, and, and in respect of uptake of technology. So do you think that the uptake and use of technology would be faster if it was less specialized, there was more sort of generic capability, if it's easier to use, I guess it's obviously going to be greater uptake if it's easier to use, but any thoughts on that? You know, the, the trend towards ever increasing complexity, um, is that always the right way to go? Blair? Yeah, I can, I can give it a go, I guess. I guess it's very difficult to answer because you don't necessarily have to see a lot of the complexity or engage with it to be able to use it. And that can be kind of a double-edged sword. It can be a little bit risky as well, but there is, I think, a level of um, sophistication of technology where it becomes very usable because it's something that self-calibrates and it's got some kind of ability to 
to tell you if the data it's gathering is good or not. So I, I do think that there, there are levels of complexity, but it's the complexity that the humans need to interface with, which is the really kind of key parameter that you need to be able to control if you want to be able to have your technology used more widely. And that could easily be something that's, um, that's facilitated by having actually some very high tech stuff going on in the background that's, uh, that's robust enough that people don't really need to engage with. So using complex technology to make the interface simpler I think there's two ways of approaching it, um, but I think making the interface simpler, whether right. that's through overall simplification or complex technologies to 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 you know do a lot of stuff in the background. Any other thoughts on that topic? Um, yes, and uh, well, two things. One one thing I think that's uh, I forgot one of the things I'll get to it. Uh, but the other thing is, you know, I think when we design things, um, also incorporating a perspective of like human robot interactions, right? There's an entire field that's focused on, you know, how do you design something such that, you know, a human can operate a robot or a, a, a robotic system most effectively. And you know, that, that's, that's an area that we don't see a lot being applied um, in the ocean, right? And, and there's a lot that we can learn um, from, that, from that area of research. Oh, the second thing is, you know, it really just depends on the science use case, right? D depends yeah. on the question that you're trying to answer. So it's really hard to, to have a blanket answer for, for that question. And I see Brett has popped up and I assume that's because he wants to say something about this. <laughs> Please go ahead. If you don't mind. Um, of course, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, we we struggle all the time with how to simplify an interface so that the sophisticated thing we need the vehicle or other systems we build to do can be easy to operate. But what I worry about is sort of, it has to start early with fundamental education in the sciences and mathematics and a real appreciation for that. I mean, we just have to redouble our efforts because as simple as the technology might get to apply, if you don't know what question you're asking or why, it doesn't matter what level of technology you've got or you won't know what to bring to bear or why it matters that you're doing those things. And, and um, you know, my daughter is, is deeply interested in physics and she goes to a, a good school in the UK, she's 15. And uh, they just constantly encourage her away from science uh, because Britain needs nurses. And that's great. That's a, a fantastic profession. But, you know, she did her work study at CERN and <laughs> they just didn't care, right? They, were, they just didn't care. They wouldn't give her an extra week off to spend time at the Large Hadron Collider. But the, the gymnastics team got a week off to go that's on a trip. Curious. And so either we care about teaching people science or we don't. And it, it starts really right at a very young age. And we are creating a consumer, a technology consumer society that doesn't serve us in the long run. Sorry. And avoiding, and avoiding stereotyping in that instance. Yeah. yeah. Of careers that perhaps <laughs> a young well, lady. Being a nurse or a doctor is a fantastic yeah. career. All she thinks about is particle physics. It's like yeah. it's become annoying for everybody around her. It's all she talks about, which is great. So we took it a CERN so she'd have people to talk to. But uh, we just couldn't get the school to care. And I see it all the time. So I'm guessing we're approaching the time to, uh, to switch over to our video feed on uh, the Perseverance rover. Um, would I be about right there? Oh, 30 seconds. So we better switch over and uh, watch some more remarkable technology. We have confirmation of entry interface. Perseverance is currently going 5.3 kilometers per second at an altitude of about 100. 20 kilometers from the surface of Mars. The fit is now waiting until it begins feeling the atmosphere of Mars to slow it down. Once there is enough atmosphere, it will start controlling its path to the landing target. 
Navigation. Navigation is also confirming that we can see a little bit of that slowdown of the atmosphere on the Perseverance entry capsule. Our current velocity is about 5.36 kilometers per second and an altitude of about 67 kilometers from the surface. We are probably seeing MRO plasma blackout at this point. The vehicle should be doing its turns right now. MRO has lost lock. Perseverance. We have indications that Perseverance is now performing bank reversals in the atmosphere. These are the steps in order to control its distance to the landing target. Uh, Perseverance has just passed through the point of maximum deceleration and has indicated that it felt approximately 10 Earth Gs of deceleration. MRO has lock again. Yes, 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 yes. We saw a small outage uh, of the UHF telemetry from Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter during that peak heating phase likely caused by the plasma blackout. Perseverance is still continuing to perform bank reversals in the atmosphere to control its distance to the landing target. Perseverance is going about one kilometer per second at an altitude of about 16 kilometers from the surface of Mars. We have entered heading alignment, which means Perseverance is no longer trying to control the distance to Mars, but in, to the target on Mars, but instead is flying straight to the target. Our current velocity is about 550 meters per second at an altitude of about 15 kilometers from the surface. MRO is reporting good telemetry lock. We are coming upon the straighten up. We are starting the straighten up and fly right maneuver where the spacecraft will jettison the entry balance masses in preparation for parachute deploy and to roll over to give the radar a better look at the ground. Yes. 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 The navigation yes. has confirmed that the parachute has deployed and we are seeing significant deceleration in the velocity. Our current velocity is 430 meters per second at an altitude of about 12 kilometers from the surface of Mars. Yes. Perseverance has now slowed to subsonic speeds and the heat shield has been separated. This allows both the radar and the cameras to get their first look at the surface. Current velocity is 145 meters per second and an altitude of about 10 kilom nine and a half kilometers above the surface. Yes, yes, Sorry. yes. Perseverance now has radar lock on the ground. Current velocity is about 100 meters per second, 6.6 yes. .6 kilometers of the surface. Right. Perseverance is continuing to descend on the parachute. We are coming up on the initialization of terrain relative navigation and subsequently the priming of the landing engines. Our current velocity is about 90 meters per second at an altitude of 4.2 kilometers. Almost there. 
we have confirmation that the lander vision system has produced a valid solution and part of terrain relative navigation. We have timing of the landing engines. Current velocity is 83 meters per second at about 2.6 kilometers from the surface of Mars. We have confirmation that the back shell has separated. We are currently performing the divert maneuver. Current velocity is about 75 meters per second at an altitude of about a kilometer off the surface of Mars. TRN safety, bravo. We have completed our terrain relative navigation. Current speed is about 30 meters per second, altitude of about 300 meters off the surface of Mars. We have started our constant velocity accordion, which means we are conducting the sky crane, about to conduct the sky crane maneuver. We've lost direct to Earth to tones. As expected. As expected. Sky crane maneuver has started. About 20 meters off the surface. We're getting signals from MRO. UHF is good. Touchdown confirmed. Yes. Perseverance safely on the surface of Mars, ready to begin seeking the sands of past life. At this point, the descent stage has flown away to a safe distance. Perseverance is continuing to transmit direct through Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter to Earth. That's pretty spectacular. <laughs> so we've just seen a spectacular demonstration of the integrated use of uh, some of the technologies we've been discussing. So just to, to close out with our panelists, I'm going to ask them a question um, connected to that. If they each had the equivalent budget of that mission for exploring the ocean, what would be their one technology wish for the future? So who would like to start? <laughs> Blair's, oh, Blair's, Blair's volunteered. <laughs> Go ahead, Blair. Yeah, I would like to see algorithms that let autonomous systems figure out how to shoot footage like a movie director. You know, these platforms, they go to places people cannot go or should not go. And they gather terabytes and terabytes of data, but it's you know, 10 second video sequences taken by a professional camera operator you know, in a documentary that really captures people's imaginations, makes them care and really inspires them. So technology to help kind of these, these robotic systems gather data that we can use to tell compelling stories and, and inspire people. That's, creative that's, AI. <laughs> that sounds quite challenging. <laughs> it's a weird. <laughs> Who's next? Uh, I I feel like if we had if we had that budget. Um, okay, background. My my background is actually in aerospace engineering, and so I, I actually came from that world. And I think what I really struggle with is how distributed our efforts are in uh, the ocean community. I'm not saying that that's a bad thing, but I think the fact that we interrupted this entire conversation to watch, yeah. you know, a robotic system land on Mars, like to me, that's that's incredible. And what would it take for us to kind of drum up the same interest, right, in in what we're doing in, in the ocean and and frankly, I think it's I think it's a messaging problem. I think yeah. I think we have to do a much better job of boiling down what our mission is uh, in the ocean. And um, you know, there's been a lot of talk. You know, we we some of us attended this UN uh, decade of the ocean um, effort. And I know US had their launch a couple of weeks ago. Maybe it was last week. Gosh, I don't know. But um, the the you know the idea that 
you know, there's a moonshot, right? There's something that galvanized a whole generation of people to do something really great. Um, should we be doing the same thing in the ocean? Like, what is our one ocean shot? And, you know, I'd love, I'd love for us to be able to do something like that. So more coherence around our message, less fragmentation. I, I yeah. certainly would endorse that one. Um, Ivona, anything you, your thoughts on that? You've got a, a billion dollars to spend. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just, again, I'm still, we're still riding on that, that, you know, high from, from the, from the successful um, uh, landing and stuff. And I'm, um, I mean, I have a million ideas and I don't know, you know, like, but none of them are like, they're just kind of like pathetic thing and really pretty much narrow minded in comparison to what Blair Kakani said. Um, so I'm going to keep them to myself. Um, but um, but I think, I mean, I just want to say that I agree with Katya, oh, sorry, with Kakani. Um, it's, um, it, it, we, have a, we have a messaging problem. Uh, we do have a messaging problem and ultimately, and this is what the reason we're going to be silent by my great ideas, how I'm going to spell a billion dollars and just jump on the same, uh, same vehicle as Kakani was saying. Uh, we need that, you know, that, uh, you know, blue marble shot. Um, that's going to take the kids and, and everybody understand why is it really important to do what we're doing. So, yeah, it's it's a problem across across our uh, across the ocean sciences, even even more so through, across earth sciences. So, yeah. Yes, and Chris, you get the final word on this one. Really, um, I was thinking of a very different road, but I think messaging and, and what Blair and Kakani had mentioned and, and Vanya are very important. I always joke with my colleagues about, um, you, you asked the question, if we had the same budget, yes, it, it, it would be um, great to have, or it's important, critical to get a, a, a moonshot, like I went to the same UN session you did Kakani that that and everyone had there was like there were hundreds of them um so there's great ideas out there I, I'll just get to my, my point which was my I always joke with colleagues at, at Lamont that what I want I want is an aircraft carrier where the or a few aircraft carriers that can go around the globe and I can fly these UAV you know fleets and swarms of UAVs and mapping out the whole ocean and you could do the same you know, similar thing with with um, underwater vehicles, the um, it's one thing. It's you know, just bear with me one second. It's one thing to put a mooring in the water at one spot and measure for a year. The next, the next um, idea in oceanography that I remember when I was a grad student was OOI, which is this this ocean infrastructure where you put out a distributed network of of in various locations. One was a um, look at size seismic up in the tectonic plates. Other one was something off of um, the east coast of the US with a pioneer array, they called it. And it was basically these, you sample smaller part of the ocean. Um, but the ocean is a very, it's very difficult to just look at one spot at one time, or even this little, uh, maybe a bigger patch. There's so much going on, you really, this uh, having a sensing network, and this is the dream, Having a sense in network that you could do something holistically, then and really answer some questions as opposed to going and looking at a little segment in time here or a little parcel of space here, I think that's the next to be the big, the big thing. So Henry Stommel's oceanographer's dream. Yes. Just spatial <laughs> presence. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the the, the uh, objective hasn't changed. So um, we're running out of time now. So it remains for me to once again thank our keynote speaker and our panelists, and most importantly, all of you in the audience for joining this session. We'll now take a 10 minute break. Please click to the next session link to join Dr. Carly Reiner, who will be talking to our future marine scientists in the student showcase promptly after the break. Thank you very much.